chapter two of abraham lincoln a history volume nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume nine by john hay and john george nicolay chapter two the cleveland convention before the snows melted it had become evident to the most narrow and malignant of mr lincoln's opponents that nothing could prevent his renomination by the republican convention which was to meet at baltimore in june there was no voice of opposition to him in any organized republican assembly except in missouri and even there the large majority of radical republicans were willing to accept the universal verdict of their party but there were a few earnest spirits scattered throughout the country to whom opposition to the administration had become the habit of a lifetime there were others not so honest who for personal reasons disliked the president to these it was impossible to stand quietly by and see mr lincoln made his own successor without one last effort to prevent it the result of informal consultations among them was the publication of a number of independent calls for a mass convention of the people to meet at cleveland ohio on the thirty first of may a week before the assembling of the republican convention at baltimore the two centres of this disaffection were in st louis and new york in the former city it was composed of a small fraction of a faction the large majority of those radical politicians who had been for two years engaged in the bitter struggle with blair and his associates still retained their connection with the republican party and had no intention of breaking off their relations with the union party of the nation it was a small fraction of their number which issued its call to the disaffected throughout the nation harking back to the original cause of quarrel they had attached themselves blindly to the personal fortunes of general fremont they now put themselves in communication with a small club of like-minded enthusiasts in new york called the central fremont club and invited their radical fellow-citizens to meet them in convention at cleveland they made no pretense of any purpose of consultation or of independent individual action the object stated in their call was in order then and there to recommend the nomination of john c fremont for the presidency of the united states and to assist in organizing for his election they denounced the imbecile and vacillating policy of the present administration in the conduct of the war its treachery to justice freedom and genuine democratic principles in its plan of reconstruction whereby the honor and dignity of the nation have been sacrificed to conciliate the still existing and arrogant slave power and to further the ends of an unscrupulous partisan ambition they demanded the immediate extinction of slavery throughout the whole united states by congressional action the absolute equality of all men before the law and a vigorous execution of the laws confiscating the property of rebels this circular was stronger in its epithets than in its signatures the names of the signers were as a rule unknown to fame one column was headed by the name of the rev george b cheever another by the apparently farcical signature of pantalion candidus perhaps the most important name affixed to this document was that of elizabeth cady stanton who wrote desiring to sign her name to the call 
taking it for granted she said you use men in its largest sense she informed the committee that they had lifted politics into the sphere of morals and religion and made it the duty of all true men and women to unite with them in building up the new nation she spelled new nation with capital letters and gave occasion for a malicious accusation that her letter was merely an advertisement of a radical fremont paper of that name which was then leading a precarious existence in new york samuel bowles inferred from her letter that the convention was to be composed of the gentler sex of both genders another call was issued by the people's committee of st louis though signed by individuals from several other states these gentlemen felt themselves impelled on our own responsibility to declare to the people that the time has come for all independent men jealous of their liberties and of the national greatness to confer together and unite to resist the swelling invasion of an open shameless and unrestrained patronage which threatens to engulf under its destructive wave the rights of the people the liberty and dignity of the nation declaring that they did not recognize in the baltimore convention the essential conditions of a truly national convention it was to be held they thought too near washington and too far from the center of the country its mode of convocation giving no guarantee of wise and honest deliberation this circular was signed by b gratz brown of missouri and by a number of old-time abolitionists in the east though its principal signers were from the ranks of the most vehement german radicals of st louis still another call was drawn up and issued by lucius robinson controller of the state of new york and others the terms of this address were properly applicable to all the administration republicans it called upon the citizens of the united states who mean to uphold the union who believe that the rebellion can be suppressed without infringing the rights of individuals or of states who regard the extinction of slavery as among the practical effects of the war for the union and favor an amendment of the federal constitution for the exclusion of slavery and who demand integrity and economy in the administration of government the signers of this call approached the question from an entirely different point of view from that of the radical germans of st louis in their view mr lincoln instead of being a craven and a laggard was going entirely too fast and too far their favorite candidate was general grant wendell phillips the stormy petrel of all our political disturbances found enjoyment even in this teapot tempest he strongly approved the convention at cleveland and constructed beforehand a brief platform for it subdue the south as rapidly as possible the moment territory comes under our flag reconstruct states thus confiscate and divide the lands of rebels extend the right of suffrage broadly as possible to whites and blacks let the federal constitution prohibit slavery throughout the union and forbid the states to make any distinction among their citizens on account of color or race he also advised the nomination for the presidency of a statesman and a patriot by which terms he intended to exclude mr lincoln the convention might have met deliberated and adjourned for all the people of the united states cared about it had it not been for the violent and enthusiastic admiration it excited in democratic newspapers and the wide publicity they gave to its proceedings they described it as a gathering of the utmost dignity and importance they pretended to discern in it a distinct line of a cleavage through the middle of the republican party 
for several days before it assembled they published imaginary dispatches from cleveland representing the streets and hotels as crowded with a throng of earnest patriots determined on the destruction of the tyrant lincoln the papers of cleveland tell another story there was no sign of political upheaval in the streets or hotels of that beautiful and thriving city up to the very day of the meeting of the convention there was no place provided for it and when the first stragglers began to arrive they found no preparation made to receive them all the public halls of any consequence were engaged and the convention at last took shelter in a small room called chapin's hall its utmost capacity was five or six hundred persons and it was much too large for the convention delegates and spectators together were never numerous enough to fill it the delegates were for the most part germans from st louis they held a preliminary meeting the night before the convention opened and passed vigorous and loyal resolutions of the usual character to the resolution that the rebellion must be put down some one moved to amend by adding the words with god's assistance which was voted down with boisterous demonstrations known tally auxilio was the sentiment of those materialist missourians the convention met at ten o'clock in a hall only half filled hoping for later arrivals they delayed organization until nearly noon the leaders who had been expected to give character and direction to the movement did not appear it was hoped until the last moment that mr greeley would be present though he had never given any authority for such an expectation he said in answer to an inquiry that the only convention he took any interest in was that one grant was holding before richmond b gratz brown the real head of the movement was also absent emile pretorius and mr cheever who from the two extremities of the country had talked most loudly in favor of the convention stayed away the only persons present whose names were at all known were general john cochran of new york colonel charles e moss a noisy politician from missouri casper butts of illinois two or three of the old school abolitionists and several not the weightiest members of the staff of general fremont the delegates from the german working men's union of chicago were discredited in advance by the publication of a card from the majority of the association they pretended to represent declaring their intention to support the nominees of the baltimore convention some one moved as usual the appointment of a committee on credentials but as no one had any valid credentials it was resolved instead to appoint a committee to enroll the names of the delegates no action was taken even upon this proposition because the act of enrollment would have been too fatal a confession of weakness the committee on organization reported the name of general cochran for president of the convention who made a discreet and moderate speech he was a man of too much native amiability of character to feel personal bitterness towards any one and too adroit and experienced a politician to commit himself irrevocably against any contingency he had in fact thrown an anchor to windward by visiting mr lincoln before the convention met and assuring him of his continued friendship a delegate from iowa who seemed to have taken the convention seriously then offered a resolution that no member of it should hold or apply for office under the next administration a proposition which was incontinently smothered while waiting for the report of the committee on the platform speeches were made by several delegates david plum attacked mr lincoln as a pro-slavery politician colonel moss of missouri denounced him as the principal obstacle to freedom in america 
a debate now arose on the proposition of the committee on rules that in voting for president the vote should be by states according to their representation in congress this was in the interest of the grant delegates and was violently opposed by the missourians who ruled the convention and had come for no purpose but to nominate fremont in the course of this debate the somewhat dreary proceedings were enlivened by a comic incident a middle-aged man who gave his name as carr addressed the chair saying that he had come from illinois as a delegate under the last call and did not want to be favored a single mite his ideas not flowing readily he repeated this declaration three times in a voice continually rising in shrillness with his excitement something in his tone stirred the risibles of the convention and loud laughter saluted the illinoisan as soon as he could make himself heard he cried out these are solemn times this statement was greeted with another laugh and the delegate now shouted at the top of his voice i believe there is a god who holds the universe in his hands as you would hold an egg this comprehensive scheme of theocracy was too much for the missouri agnostics and the convention broke out in a tumult of jeers and roars the rural delegate amazed at the reception of his confession of faith and apparently in doubt whether he had not stumbled by accident into a lunatic asylum paused and asked the chairman in a tone of great seriousness whether he believed in a god the wildest merriment now took possession of the assembly in the midst of which the illinois theist solemnly marched down the aisle and out of the house shaking from his feet the dust of that unbelieving convention as soon as the laughing died away the committee on resolutions reported a set of judicious and on the whole undeniable propositions such as the union must and shall be preserved the constitutional laws of the united states must be obeyed the rebellion must be suppressed by force of arms and without compromise the platform did not greatly differ from that subsequently adopted at baltimore except that it spoke in favor of one presidential term declared that to congress instead of the president belonged the question of reconstruction and advocated the confiscation of the property of the rebels and its distribution among the soldiers the platform was adopted after brief debate and a letter from wendell phillips was read to the convention full of the vehement unreason which distinguished most of the attempts of this matchless orator to apply his mind to the practical affairs of life he predicted the direst results from four more years of lincoln's administration unless the south is recognized which he apparently thought not improbable under lincoln's nerveless policy the war will continue the taxation needed to sustain our immense debt doubled by that time will grind the laboring man of the north down to the level of the pauper labor of europe and we shall have a government accustomed to despotic power for eight years a fearful peril to democratic institutions he denounced mr lincoln's plan of reconstruction and drew this comical parallel between him and fremont the administration therefore i regard as a civil and military failure and its avowed policy ruinous to the north in every point of view mr lincoln may wish the end peace and freedom but he is wholly unwilling to use the means which can secure that end if mr lincoln is re-elected i do not expect to see the union reconstructed in my day unless on terms more disastrous to liberty than even disunion would be 
if i turn to general fremont i see a man whose first act was to use the freedom of the negro as his weapon i see one whose thorough loyalty to democratic institutions without regard to race whose earnest and decisive character whose clear-sighted statesmanship and rare military ability justify my confidence that in his hands all will be done to save the state that foresight skill decision and statesmanship can do with characteristic reliance on his own freedom from prejudice he continued this is an hour of such peril to the republic that i think men should surrender all party and personal partiality and support any man able and willing to save the state this was in fact the attitude of mind of the vast majority of the people of the country but all it meant in mr phillips's case was that he was willing to vote for either fremont or butler to defeat lincoln a feeble attempt was now made by the delegates from new york who called themselves war democrats to induce the convention to nominate general grant andrew j colvin read a letter from lucius robinson of new york afterwards governor of that state attacking the errors and blunders of a weak executive and cabinet and claiming that the hope of the people throughout the country rested upon general grant as a candidate although mr colvin supplemented the reading of this letter by promising a majority of one hundred thousand for grant in the state of new york the missourians cheered only the louder for fremont and when a last effort was made by george w demers of albany to nominate grant he was promptly denounced as a lincoln hireling colonel moss in the uniform of a general of the missouri militia arose and put a stop to the profitless discussion by moving in a stentorian voice the nomination of general fremont by acclamation which was at once done and the assembly completed its work by placing john cochran on the ticket as its candidate for vice-president no one present seemed to have any recollection of the provision of the constitution which forbids electors voting for citizens of their own state for both these places the convention met again in the evening and listened to dispirited and discouraging speeches of ratification the committee appointed in the afternoon to give a name to the new party brought in that of the radical democracy and in this style it was formally christened an executive committee was appointed of men destitute of executive capacity and the convention adjourned its work met with no response from the country on the day of its meeting the german press of cleveland expressed its profound disappointment at the smallness and insignificance of the gathering and with a few unimportant exceptions the newspapers of the country greeted the work of the convention with an unbroken chorus of ridicule its absurdities and inconsistencies were indeed too glaring for serious consideration its movers had denounced the baltimore convention as being held too early for an expression of the deliberate judgment of the people and now they had made their own nominations a week earlier they had claimed that baltimore was not sufficiently central in situation and they had held their convention on the northern frontier of the country they had claimed that the baltimore delegates were not properly elected and they had assumed to make nominations by delegates not elected at all they had denounced the baltimore convention as a close corporation and invited the people to assemble in mass and when they came together they were so few they never dared to count themselves they had pretended to desire a stronger candidate than mr lincoln and had selected the most conspicuous failure of the war they clamoured loudly against corruption in office and one of the leading personages in the convention was a member of fremont's staff who had been dismissed the service for dishonesty in government contracts the whole proceeding though it excited some indignation among the friends of mr lincoln was regarded by the president himself only with amusement 
on the morning after the convention a friend giving him an account of it said that instead of the many thousands who had been expected there were present at no time more than four hundred men the president struck by the number mentioned reached for the bible which commonly lay on his desk and after a moment's search read these words and every one that was in distress and every one that was in debt and every one that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about four hundred men it was only among the democratic papers that the cleveland convention met with any support or applause they gave it solemn and unmeasured eulogies for its independence its patriotism its sagacity and even its numbers the copperhead papers in new york urged the radicals not to give up their attitude of uncompromising hostility to lincoln and predicted a formidable schism in the republican party as a consequence of their action but the motive of this support was so evident that it deceived nobody and it was compared by a sarcastic observer to the conduct of the spanish urchins accompanying a condemned jew to an auto da fe and shouting in the fear that he might recant and rob them of their holiday stand fast moses the ticket of the two new yorkers met with a gust of ridicule which would have destroyed more robust chances than theirs the new york major-general john c and the new york brigadier-general john c formed a matched ticket fated to laughter but if no one else took them seriously the two generals at least saw in the circumstances no occasion for smiling general fremont promptly accepted his nomination he said this is not an ordinary election it is a contest for the right even to have candidates and not merely as usual for the choice among them the ordinary rights secured under the constitution and the laws of the country have been violated and extraordinary powers have been usurped by the executive it is directly before the people now to say whether or not the principles established by the revolution are worth maintaining to-day we have in the country the abuses of a military dictation without its unity of action and vigor of execution an administration marked at home by disregard of constitutional rights by its violation of personal liberty and the liberty of the press and as a crowning shame by its abandonment of the right of asylum the feebleness and want of principle of the administration its incapacity and selfishness were roundly denounced by general fremont but he repudiated the cry of the cleveland convention for confiscating the property of rebels in conclusion he said if the convention at baltimore will nominate any man whose past life justifies a well-grounded confidence in his fidelity to our cardinal principles there is no reason why there should be any division among the really patriotic men of the country to any such i shall be most happy to give a cordial and active support but if mr lincoln should be nominated as i believe it will be fatal to the country to endorse a policy and renew a power which has cost us the lives of thousands of men and needlessly put the country on the road to bankruptcy there will remain no other alternative but to organize against him every element of conscientious opposition with a view to prevent the misfortune of his re-election he therefore accepted the nomination and informed the committee that he had resigned his commission in the army general cochran accepted in briefer and more judicious language holding the same views as his chief on the subject of confiscation later in the summer some of the partisans of fremont seeing that there was positively no response in the country to his candidacy wrote to him suggesting that the candidates nominated at cleveland and baltimore should both withdraw 
and leave the field entirely free for a united effort for a new convention which should represent the patriotism of all parties they asked him whether in case mr lincoln would withdraw he would do so although the contingency referred to was more than sufficiently remote general fremont with unbroken dignity refused to accede to this proposition having now definitely accepted the cleveland nomination he said i have not the right to act independently of the truly patriotic and earnest party who conferred that honor upon me it might besides have only the effect still further to unsettle the public mind and defeat the object you have in view if we should disorganize before first proceeding to organize something better but a month later he seemed to have regarded the public mind as beyond the risk of unsettling and he then wrote to his committee withdrawing his name from the list of candidates he could not however withhold a parting demonstration against the president in respect to mr lincoln he said i continue to hold exactly the sentiments contained in my letter of acceptance i consider that his administration has been politically militarily and financially a failure and that its necessary continuance is a cause of regret for the country there never was a greater unanimity in a country than was exhibited here at the fall of sumter and the south was powerless in the face of it but mr lincoln completely paralyzed this generous feeling he destroyed the strength of the position and divided the north when he declared to the south that slavery should be protected he has built up for the south a strength which otherwise they could have never attained and this has given them an advocate on the chicago platform with a final denunciation of the leading men whose reticence had established for him mr lincoln a character among the people which leaves now no choice general fremont at last subsided into silence general cochrane on the same day withdrew his name from the cleveland ticket which already passed into swift oblivion his letter had none of the asperity which characterized that of his chief he genially attacked the chicago resolutions and while regretting the omissions of the baltimore platform he approved it in substance we stand within view he said of a rebellion suppressed within hail of a country reunited and saved war lifts the curtain and discloses the prospect war has given to us atlanta and war offers to us richmond peace and division or war and the union other alternative there is none two incidents which occurred in the spring of eighteen sixty four caused unusual excitement among both wings of the opposition to mr lincoln the one was the delivery of our guells to the spanish authorities the other was the seizure of two new york newspapers for publishing a forged proclamation it was altogether natural that the pro-slavery democrats and peacemen should have objected to these acts as one of the injured parties was a slave trader and the others opponents of the war but it was not the least of the absurdities of the cleveland protestants that they were also in their anxiety to find a weapon against the president at the very moment that they were assailing him for not overriding all law and precedent in obedience to their demand still belabored him for these instances of energetic action in the very direction in which they demanded that he should proceed 
the case of aguel was a perfectly clear one and if the surrender of a criminal is ever justified as an exercise of international comity in the absence of treaty stipulations no objections could reasonably be made in this instance he was a colonel in the spanish army and lieutenant governor of the district of colon in cuba he had captured a cargo of african slaves in his official capacity and had received much credit for his efficiency and a considerable sum of money as his share of the prize he went to new york immediately afterwards and purchased a spanish newspaper which was published there but after his departure from cuba it was ascertained that in beginning so extensive a business in new york he did not rely exclusively upon the money he had received from the government but that in concert with a curate of colon he had sold one hundred and forty-one of the recaptured africans had put the money in his own pocket and had officially reported them as having died of smallpox the cuban government laid these facts before the state department at washington and represented that the return of this miscreant to cuba was necessary to secure the liberation of the unfortunate victims of his cruelty and greed it was impossible to bring the matter before the courts as no extradition treaty existed at that period between spain and the united states and the american authorities could not by any legal procedure take cognizance of the crime the president and mr seward at once assumed the responsibility of acting in the only way indicated by the laws of common humanity and international courtesy arguelles was arrested in new york by the united states marshal put in charge of a spanish officer commissioned for the purpose and by him taken to havana the action of the government was furiously attacked by all the pro-slavery organs a resolution was introduced by reverdy johnson in the senate demanding an explanation of the circumstances mr seward answered basing the action of the government upon the stipulations of the ninth article of the treaty of eighteen forty two with great britain by which the two countries agreed to use all the measures in their power to close the market for slaves throughout the world and added although there is a conflict of authorities concerning the expediency of exercising comity towards a foreign government by surrendering at its request one of its own subjects charged with the commission of crime within its territory and although it may be conceded that there is no national obligation to make such a surrender upon a demand therefore unless it is acknowledged by treaty or by statute law yet a nation is never bound to furnish asylum to dangerous criminals who are offenders against the human race and it is believed that if in any case the comity could with propriety be practised the one which is understood to have called forth the resolution furnished a just occasion for its exercise the captain-general of cuba on the arrival of arguelles sent his thanks to mr seward for the service which he had rendered to humanity by furnishing the medium through which a great number of human beings will obtain their freedom whom the desertion of the person referred to would have reduced to slavery his presence alone in this island a very few hours has given liberty to eighty-six the grand jury of new york nevertheless indicted marshal robert murray for the arrest of arguelles on the charge of kidnapping the marshal pleaded the orders of the president as the authority for his action and based upon this a petition that the case be transferred to the united states court and although the judges before whom he was taken who happened to be democrats denied this petition the indictment was finally quashed and the only result of the president's action was the denunciation which he received in the democratic newspapers combined with the shrill treble of the clamor from the cleveland convention 
the momentary suppression of the two new york newspapers of which mention has been made was a less defensible act and arose from an error which was after all sufficiently natural on the part of the secretary of war on the nineteenth of may the journal of commerce and the world two newspapers which had especially distinguished themselves by the violence of their opposition to the administration published a forged proclamation signed by the president's name calling in terms of exaggerated depression not far from desperation for four hundred thousand troops it was a scheme devised by two young bohemians of the press probably with no other purpose than that of making money by stock jobbing in the tremulous state of the public mind which then prevailed in the midst of the terrible slaughter of grant's opening campaign the country was painfully sensitive to such news and the forged proclamation telegraphed far and wide accomplished for the moment the purpose for which it was doubtless intended it excited everywhere a feeling of consternation the price of gold rose rapidly during the morning hours and the stock exchange was thrown into violent fever the details of the mystification were managed with some skill the paper on which the document was written being that employed by the associated press in delivering its news to the journals and it was left at all the newspaper offices in new york just before the moment of going to press if all the newspapers had printed it the guiltlessness of each would have been equally evident but unfortunately for the victims of the trick the only two papers which published the forgery were those whose previous conduct had rendered them liable to the suspicion of bad faith the fiery secretary of war immediately issued orders for the suppression of the world and journal of commerce and the arrest of their editors the editors were never incarcerated after a short detention they were released the publication of the papers was resumed after two days of interruption these prompt measures and the announcement of the imposture sent over the country by telegraph soon quieted the excitement and the quick detection of the guilty persons reduced the incident to its true rank in the annals of vulgar misdemeanors but in the memories of the democrats of new york the incident survived and was vigorously employed during the summer months as a means of attack upon the administration governor seymour interested himself in the matter and wrote a long and vehement letter to the district attorney of new york denouncing the action of the government these things he said in his exclamatory style are more hurtful to the national honor and strength than the loss of battles the world will confound such acts with the principles of our government and the folly and crimes of officials will be looked upon as the natural results of the spirit of our institutions our state and local authorities must repel this ruinous inference he predicted the most dreadful consequences to the city of new york if this were not done the harbor would be sealed up the commerce of new york paralyzed the world would withdraw from the keeping of new york merchants its treasures and its commerce if they did not unite in this demand for the security of persons and of property in obedience to these frantic orders a oakey hall the district attorney did his best and was energetically seconded by judge russell who charged the grand jury that the officers who took possession of these newspaper establishments were liable as for riot but the grand jury who seemed to have kept their heads more successfully than either the governor or the judge resolved that it was inexpedient to examine into the subject the governor could not rest quiet under this contemptuous refusal of the grand jury to do his bidding he wrote again to the district attorney saying as they the grand jury have refused to do their duty the subject of the seizure of these journals should at once be brought before some proper magistrate 
he promised him all the assistance he required in the prosecution of the investigations thus egged on by the chief executive of the state mr hall proceeded to do the work required of him upon warrants issued at his instance by city judge russell general dix and several officers of his staff were arrested they submitted with perfect courtesy to the behest of the civil authorities and appeared before judge russell to answer for their acts the judge held them over on their own recognizance to await the action of another grand jury which it was hoped might be more subservient to the wishes of the governor than the last but no further action was ever taken during the same week which witnessed the radical fiasco at cleveland an attempt was made in new york to put general grant before the country as a presidential candidate the committee having the matter in charge made no public avowal of their intentions they merely called a meeting to express the gratitude of the country to the general for his signal services they even invited the president to take part in the proceedings an invitation which he said it was impossible for him to accept i approve he wrote nevertheless whatever may tend to strengthen and sustain general grant and the noble armies now under his direction my previous high estimate of general grant has been maintained and heightened by what has occurred in the remarkable campaign he is now conducting while the magnitude and difficulty of the task before him do not prove less than i expected he and his brave soldiers are now in the midst of their great trial and i trust that at your meeting you will so shape your good words that they may turn to men and guns moving to his and their support with such a gracious approval of the movement the meeting naturally fell into the hands of the lincoln men general grant neither at this time nor at any other gave the least countenance to the efforts which were made to array him in political opposition to the president End of chapter two